Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome in to the Co-opting AI space. It's good um, to have you. Um, everybody take their seat. As you know, what I always say at this point of uh, the Co-opting AI event is, you know, just imagine we would be actually in the Institute for Public Knowledge space in uh, Manhattan at the Bowery, and we would be, you know, arriving and uh, going to the buffet and getting a drink and a little snack and connecting to people who we have not seen in a very long time um, and want to reconnect with. Um, so there would be music playing and you would you know, <laughs> slowly sit down now um, and I would grab the mic and um, with this I'm actually gonna formally open the uh, co-opting AI event on reproduction welcome everybody welcome back thank you for being here and as i said today i'm hosting two leading wonderful scholars um, who will be having a conversation about something that somehow seems far removed from technology but in fact is deeply connected to it which is human reproduction. My name is Dr. Mona Sona. I am a sociologist at New York University. I study the intersection of design, society, and technology, and I focus on artificial intelligence, design, and policy. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge, a re senior research scientist at NYU Center for Responsible AI at NYU Tandon, where I also teach the next generation of engineers, which is a joy and an honor. And I'm the convener of the Co-opting AI series. I wanna take a moment to thank the sponsors of the series for their very generous and ongoing support, which is of course the Institute for Public Knowledge, the 370G Project, the NYU Center for Responsible AI, and the Department of Technology, Culture and Society at NYU Tandon. And before we begin this timely and very important conversation, I want to acknowledge that I'm standing on the unceded land of the Lanape peoples and that I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lanape community and the indigenous communities on whose land you may be located and to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I also want to express my commitment to the ongoing project to tackle white privilege and systemic racism and to develop an anti-racist culture in our communities and institutions, and of course the academy in particular. Now one could argue that the rules of reproduction are the last bastion of heteronormative and patriarchal power structures. And that breaking them entirely could very well trigger an entire reshuffle of the social worlds that we inhabit. Just the other day, actually, I read an article about a Silicon Valley company that has set out to artificially create human eggs or sperm from adult cells. That reproduction is an arena for political struggle is not a new discovery, neither is that technology has always been integral to that struggle from the contraceptive pill to abortion techniques or novel fertility trackers on our phones. Now, artificial intelligence is decidedly moving into the field of assisted reproductive technology. Large amounts of data on fertility related issues, some of which we produce ourselves through set tracking devices, those appear as large data troves that once turned into models can help with things like embryo and sperm assessment. Other areas in which AI plays a role in human reproduction is diagnostics, for example, in screenings for adverse perinatal outcomes or in the context of genetic testing. Now with today's co-oping AI event, we want to explore how AI technologies have changed the narratives and rationalities that underpin assisted reproduction from early feminist initiative to the commercialization of pregnancies and the tactics used in scientific research on human reproduction. Hopefully we'll consider how these dynamics map onto racial disparities and wider inequalities in public health and beyond. Now, I am truly honored to be hosting my two guests today 
who will guide us through this discussion, Dr. Natalie Valdez and Dr. Karis Thompson. Starting us off will be Dr. Valdez, who is an anthropologist based at Wellesley College. See, she specializes in feminist and ethnographic methodologies. Her work lies at the intersections of the feminist technoscience, medical anthropology, and public health. Her teaching and research attend to how histories of violence and racism have enveloped into scientific knowledge production. She draws from Black feminism and post-colonial feminist science studies to explore the entanglements between nature, culture, science, society, and the human, non-human. Her current book project, her book is actually out soon, Weighing the Future. Um, and we have a book voucher for you that um, a wonderful um, uh, communication fellow, Sam, will put into the chat. Um, her new book explores the clinical translation of epigenetics and randomized clinical trials that experiment on pregnant bodies. As the first ethnography of this kind, Wing the Future illuminates how processes of post-genomic knowledge production are linked to capitalism, surveillance, and systemic racism. As I said, book will be out next month with um, University of California Press. Um, and Dr. Valdez's other research interests, and we don't want to leave those out, explore issues of big data and evidence-based medicine, feminist materiality, environmental racism, and the creative ways in which feminist and ethnographic methods can be used to study scientific methods. Now, following Dr. Uh, Valdez will be one of the leading figures in the field of science and technology studies, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome my former mentor, Dr. Harris Thompson, to Co-opting AI. She is the Chancellor's Professor and Associate Dean for Campus Partnerships and a former founding director of the Science, Technology, and Society Center at UC Berkeley. She's an expert on the ethics of reproductive technologies and stem cell research. She read philosophy, psychology, and physiology at Oxford University and got her PhD from the Science Studies Program at UC San Diego. She's the author of Making Parents, the Ontological Choreography of Reproductive Technology, which won the 2007 Rachel Carson Award from the Society for the Social Study of Science and of Good Science, the Ethical Choreography of Stem Cell Research. She's the recipient of the Social Science Division Distinguished Teaching Award and an honorary doctorate for services to science in society from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Last year, she was visiting professor at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, co-convening the seminar on science and the state. She served on the World Economic Forum, Global Future Council on Technology, Values and Policy, and the Nuffield Working Group on Human Genome Modification. Please join me in welcoming both Dr. Valdez and Dr. Thompson. And just uh, one more word at housekeeping. We have an hour together today. We will hear for about five to 10 minutes from each panelist. In the meantime, please put your questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. I will collect those for the Q&A part, which will follow a short conversation between the panelists that I will moderate after their presentations. We will also stream this onto Twitter as per usual, and you can also switch on, switch on closed captions. And with that, I'm gonna be quiet and I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Valdez. Thank you both so much for being here. mute it. I, of course, I would do that. <laughs> I'm on sabbatical, so uh, I haven't given a Zoom talk in a while, but um, okay. So uh, I, I'm i very thankful. Thank you, Mona, for inviting me here. Um, it is such an honor to have the opportunity to be in conversation with Karis Thompson, who supported me during the early phases of developing this project, which has culminated into um, the book Weighing the Future, which uh, Mona um, elegantly introduced. So thank you for that. 
book plug. Um, as part of my research on pregnancy trials, I observed many blood draw, uh, blood collections. So the scene I describe here, um, and I wouldn't be an anthropologist if I didn't start with an ethnographic vignette, comes from a data collection visit between a pregnant participant enrolled in a clinical trial and a research midwife who works on the clinical trial in the United Kingdom. Okay, so the midwife feels for a vein with her bare hands, walking her index and middle finger across the skin. She comments, veins are small and continues searching. The participant draws in a breath as the needle pierces her flesh and red fluid rushes out into the attached tube. She keeps breathing deeply while the midwife tries to chat with her. The participant asks, what are these blood, for, blood tests for? The midwife explains, we take these bloods and compare across experimental and control groups. You will not get any of these, any results from these blood tests. Occasionally, the participants would complain about having their blood taken. As one participant was getting her blood drawn for the first time in the trial, she exclaimed, oh, that's a lot of blood. The midwife responded, it's just four teaspoons, not that much, I promise. End quote. The midwives would also remind the participants that they produce more blood during pregnancy. Some studies find that pregnant people produce around 30% more blood during pregnancy. Um, the staff in the trial used this fact to justify the collection of the quote surplus blood. And this surplus uh, blood was collected at large scale clinical trials and provided large amounts of genetic material. So the blood collected in these trials is processed and organized into tiny plastic tubes of DNA samples ready for any kind of analysis. These are what I call pregnant bio bits. And the UK trial alone had to manage hundreds of thousands of samples and eventually ran out of freezer space to store them all. In the process of compiling and amassing pregnant bio bits into thousands of tiny tubes that are stored in freezers, analyzed and shared with public and private groups, one person's blood draw and more importantly, one person's living conditions, exposures to toxic environments and racism disappear from view. In this form, the bio bits are domesticated into discrete variables, measurable and comparable. In my reflections today, I'll share how these pregnant bio bits prospected from a pregnancy trial tell a larger story about capitalism and predictive medicine in a 21st century post-genomic era. In my book, I ethnographically study pregnancy trials because they're an important site for prospecting pregnant bio bits. Currently, there are more clinical trials that target pregnant people for behavioral interventions than ever before. In the past two decades, the National Institutes of Health in the United States and the United Kingdom have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into prenatal trials aimed at understanding future health risks associated with obesity during pregnancy. International prenatal trials are all similar in that they target large ethnographic diverse sample sizes and they focus on individual lifestyle changes that are mainly funded in design and implemented in the global north. So prenatal lifestyle trials, um, over 75% of all clinical trials globally are, are funded and designed out of the global north. And this goes the same for, for behavioral trials. So I place pregnancy trials at the nexus of what I call racial surveillance biocapitalism. I draw on Cedric Robbins's work on racial capitalism, which lays the foundation for understanding how Western capitalism was founded on the exploitation and racialization of black bodies. Black feminists further theorize the fundamental role that race, gender, and reproduction played in the extraction and exploitation of bodies in the aftermath of slavery. So black Marxist and feminist scholarship provide the theoretical framework for understanding how the power relations of exploitation that structured slavery remain relevant for understanding contemporary forms of dispossession across reproduction and in relation to race and racism. The emergent forms of capital accumulation made possible through innovations in science and technology to extract resources, exploit labor, and create surplus include surveillance and biocapitalism. And I wrote, I root both of these forms of capitalism in racial capital. 
surveillance capitalism, and I'll just explain surveillance capitalism because I'm assuming most people have heard of biocapitalism. Um, surveillance capitalism takes human experience and translates it into behavioral data, which then accrues uh, value in markets. The collection of massive amounts of behavioral data is used to predict consumer behavior for market purposes. So for example, Femtech is the digital product space that targets, quote, women's health, encompassing apps that track menstruation, fertility, weight loss, nutrition, breast milk production. These apps collect information such as frequency of bowel movement, the odor, color, and texture of vaginal discharge, and the number of orgasms in a month. For the, quote, user, these data can predict a and chart um, menstruation and fertility cycles or milk production. The service provided in exchange for the user's data. So you input your data, everybody inputs your data, an algorithm can kind of um, be generated in order to predict when you could potentially have your next period or your next fertile date. However, these data are also valuable to advertising companies making femtech and its data a billion dollar industry. Beyond the consumer context, the emphasis on quote big data to predict future outcomes is also speculatively valuable in evidence-based medicine, such as pregnancy trials. The collection of health data in a clinical trial setting is part of the same business of big data, but at a different scale and temporality. Instead of millions of bits of data collected per second, the trials I study laboriously collect biobehavioral data from thousands of pregnant bodies over the course of months, years, and up to a lifetime in longitudinal birth cohorts. The data collected at the pregnancy trials I study include measurable behavioral information like step counts, calories, weight measurements, sleeping patterns, all of which you could also input into your iPhone or um, I watch and biosamples. The biological samples provide genetic data that are collected multiple times during and after pregnancy. These pregnancy data can amount to hundreds of thousands of genetic samples that, as I mentioned before, can be analyzed to predict health outcomes for a future medical market for those who can afford it or standard intervention uh, measures for broader prenatal care or uh, risky groups. So prenatal trials provide the body's data and funding that are required to understand how behavioral modifications can shape future biological outcomes. By ethnographically examining pregnancy trials, I found a connection across surveillance capitalism, biocapitalism. On the surface, the difference might seem that surveillance capitalism focuses on behavioral data and experience and that biocapitalism might focus primarily on biological and biomatter. Um, but through epigenetics, as a theory that bridges nature and nurture, the biological and the behavioral material that are collected from pregnant bodies carries new value for the prediction and surveillance of future health, arguably another kind of future market. For instance, disciplining an adult to count their calories and steps is profitable in the near term, but surveying and disciplining a pregnant person to count their calorie steps and blood glucose levels carries potential savings and unequal earnings into the future. So you might be wondering, what is the connection between the biobehavioral data that are extracted from pregnant bodies and prenatal trials and speculative value predictive medicine, and who benefits? So for instance, private companies and governments can benefit financially from pre pregnancy biobehavioral data. In the United Kingdom, pregnancy data, including genetic data, can be shared with private industry collaborators. And this way, private companies may use the data collected through publicly funded trials to develop biomarkers, um, which are used to predict or um, assess disease manifestations. So governments also envision the potential value of biomarker discoveries. For instance, articles promoted by the NHS or the National Health Service in the UK explain that predicting diabetes in the future is so valuable that the potential cure can justify the disinvestment in public health care in the present. That is, if they can prevent diabetes in the future, they will not need to provide costly comprehensive health care services. And this is where the stakes increase, particularly for pregnant populations and vulnerable communities. 
So while innovations have resulted from the predictive medicine, have while important innovations have resulted from predictive medicine, my point is that the overdetermined speculative agendas solely focus on the discovery of biomarkers for the prediction of gestational diabetes, silver bullets or simple cures, um, drain limited resources away from social and public safety nets that are fundamental to public health. In this way, speculative future-oriented approaches disproportionately impact vulnerable populations. Those who are in the position to speculate or bet on a future remedy or silver bullet or cure are not the ones who suffer the consequences of failed predictions. That is, the people in charge of investing millions of dollars of public money into clinical trials in the hope of finding a cure for obesity and diabetes will not suffer the consequences of an emaciated public health care system. Simply put, and here I'll close, we don't need more biomarkers to predict or tell us who will get sick from obesity and diabetes. We already know who will get sick. Predominantly, poor people of color continue to get sick at disproportionate rates. This is further evidenced by the COVID-19 global pandemic. And I'll end here, um, but I'm excited to, to, for the discussion. Should I take off? Yes, Mona? please take um, off. Thank you. It's absolutely delightful and honor and a privilege to be here with Professor Valdez and, Mon and Dr. Sloan. Um, please do buy and read um, Natalie's <laughs> book. Um, and another one actually that came to mind that's a new book that's very relevant to what you were saying is James Battle's book, Sweetness. Um, so I rec highly recommend to anybody who's listening both those, those books. Um, I am going to share some rather um, dull looking slides, but uh, Let's, uh, are those, uh, can you see those okay? Yes, can you see great. those okay? Yeah, okay, so great. Um, so this topic is very uh, close to a, a lot of things I'm thinking about in the, at the moment, um, partly because of my role as an associate dean working with the Berkeley um, Computing Data Science and Society Division, which is becoming a college at UC Berkeley at the moment and has just started a computational precision health initiative with UCSF um, and uh, we're very excited about it and obviously the um, social ethical health equity dy um, dynamics of that are going to be critical in the years to come um, but it also tracks with a lot of themes that I've follow followed in my work over the years. Uh, so what I thought I would do was just look just go through a couple of places where AI is being used a lot in relation to um, fertility at the moment um, and, uh, and then um, set us up so that we're ready to have a discussion together. Um, so fertility tracking and both Natalie and Mona have already mentioned this, but I wanted to give you a sense of what it's used for and what the range of apps are. So it's when you're trying to conceive or TTC as people would have it, um, or, if, or if you're not trying to conceive. I actually don't know how much people use what used to in my day be called natural contraception, natural cycle contraceptions. I'm not sure how many people use these trackers not to conceive, um, but they certainly use them in the TTC um, arena. So um, one of the common ones is flow, and that's based on self-reported self-tracking. So that's biobehavioral data. You put in your own information. Mira is another very common one. And as you can see, there's a sort of a, um, as a so Mira combines that same kind of self-reported um, cycle data with your analysis. So it has biomaterial involved as well. Um, so, uh, and many, and I don't know if anyone listening is using any of these, but um, I'm sure that you all, many people in the Global North know people who, if you're not yourself using them, know somebody who has used one or both of these. Um, I'm told that it's increasingly common for um, younger women to, um, younger menstruating people to uh, use fertility trackers, whatever else is going on in their lives, perhaps as a way to measure their um, their mental health and other uh, comorbidities um, in a time of, um, of crisis like COVID as much as, as, much as their fertility. Apricity is um, 
an interesting one. Um, that's an unusual word that means the warmth of the sun in winter. It's a rather um, ugly sounding word, but with a beautiful meaning. Um, and it's, you know, all of the, the words of these things, they're all very um, feminine slash feminized um, and, and catchy. And that's, acricity is basically a concierge service. So it hooks you up to good to, um, to providers of various kinds, but it does also, you have two kinds of um, fertility predictors. And one is your kind of quote unquote natural um, likelihood of getting pregnant based on a few um, basics like your age and so on, um, age, weight and so on. Um, and then the, um, uh, then it has a fertility treatment predictor. The um, so-called natural one uses uh, um, 29, it uses the data from 29 scientific studies that themselves summarize uh, likelihood of getting pregnant in a given cycle. Um, the fertility treatment predictor uses um, H HFEA, so it's the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in the UK, it uses cycles from 2010 to 2016, um, 489,000 recorded cycles uh, to uh, predict um, your likelihood of fertility treatment working for you if you're like the cases for which fertility treatment did work. Um, so it's, it's giving you these ideas of kind of steering you toward, you'd be more likely to need egg donation, you'd be more likely to need this kind of treatment or that kind of treatment based on these other factors, or maybe you need a year to detox if you've been living a very stressful life or in, in a place with a lot of environmental toxins, or whatever, it gives you different ideas of where you might be technically. So fertility tracking is a it's relatively basic data, but it's um, absolutely ubiquitous at this point and becoming increasingly normalized in what Natalie and Mona referred to as kind of the, the, more, the more middle class and affluent experience of, of, um, of um, fertility and pregnancy today. The place where a lot of the news and certainly the, um, the uh, market speculation is occurring is biomedical. Um, and uh, the two big areas um, are IVF um, and uh, geometric deep learning AI is being used for egg and embryo selection. And then in general, embryology automation is um, you know, considered to be a good use. Uh, the goal, there's two goals for um, using AI in IVF. One is to increase effectiveness um, and, and bring down the price. So that, that sweet point between the likelihood of it working. So in other words, the unit cost of a, of a successful, of, of a take home baby, as they used to say, and again, in my day, um, versus on the other hand, the second thing is this idea, you know, the idea of the promise or the opportunity of AI and biomedical fertility treatment, which is to increase and maintain inclusivity and health, health and well-being. Um, for people who have historically and are currently um, tend to be have historically been either grotesquely or somewhat disadvantaged in fertility, either the recognition, the, the thriving of your offspring, the recognition of the, your offspring, the, um, the, um, the capacity to keep the being allowed to keep your own children um, and, uh, and, uh, have, and have healthy pregnancies. And those include people with disability, um, LGBT parents of various kinds, people in the military, postponed childbearing, environmental toxins, toxic environments, comorbidities of various kinds, in, in, including diabetes and weight, and um, PCOS is a big area that, the, that AI is being used in. Um, and then, the, and then it's also it also promises to be cost effective and more healthy for third, fourth, and fifth party reproducers, egg and sperm donors, and surrogates, which can again can be very important in combined with um, with toxins, combined with postponed childbearing, combined with LGBT parenting, and so on. Um, I just put down the phrase there, selective pronatalism, which is an expression I used early in my work right back in Making Parents, which is the, um, my, my interest in how states look at um, and recognize um, a, a contraception and proception and the ways in which it's nearly always the case. I've never found an exception to, the, to, it, to, the, to states promoting the reproduction of some people and 
promoting the contraception of others. Sometimes it's done in a submersive and in, in a kind of implicit way that you're, if you, um, you can get contraception for free, if you're in this income bracket, you can get healthcare benefits that include IVF coverage in this income bracket. So sometimes it's, it's, you're not explicitly saying you're supporting these pregnancies rather than those, the fertility of these people rather than those, but it turns out to be like that. Um, the other big area is um, genome editing, and that's coming, and companies like AstraZeneca are investing um, in this already and beginning to produce reports on it. Um, and it's combined with, um, as, as Mona and Natalie said, with health, health economics outcome research, so biobehavioral research with the AI and um, ML stuff. This was a, I'm not going to go through this, but this was a, this was a landmark paper on um, bringing AI into improving IVF. And so the HFEA, the European Reproduction ASRM, are all um, taking it very seriously because it's beginning to be evidence-based. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of things here. So in when just when a human beings trained embryologists do it, there are different results between embryologists on which embryos they pick. Um, and that can lead to people, it leads to uncertainties, which leads to too many uh, multiple pregnancies and other complications. Um, automated embryo assessment promises to um, cut that down, that variance down and make it more accurate. Note that they put the word unbiased, which we'll return to in a minute. Um, and at the, this paper was, was the one that reported outperforming individual embryologists. And it went straight in its abstract to the idea that this is hand in hand with the revolution in personalized medicine. So personalized strategies to select embryos. Okay, another area though that I do want to talk about is AI and community forums. This is much more, in some sense, it's much more interesting because it um, really includes people from far wider um, socioeconomic, racial, um, ability, illness, and so on backgrounds. Um, uh, it, it, and what to expect is one of the huge, huge forums here. There are birth month forums for every, every month that your child is due. There are hundreds of thousands of people on these forums and they talk about conception, pregnancy, infant and toddler um, uh, development, and so on. Um, but there are many of these, Mumtastic, The Bump, The Pregistry, Baby Center, Mums Net, Reddit for Pregnancy. Um, two quick things I wanted to draw attention to was one that they, it's a place where you can find other people going through the raw emotional day-to-day -day of development, looking for reassurance, um, dealing with rare conditions. There's also flexing, my baby walked at three months, why isn't yours walking yet, you know, and then there's a little bit of correction and people are like, are you flexing? No, I'm just rightfully proud, you know, there's, so there's a little bit of, you get a little bit of moral community going on with, with some telling off. Um, it's also a place where you see really serious polarization that isn't only political. So of course you get the COVID stuff and it's, it, it follows all the, all the um, uh, affective polarization things, do or don't get, your, get a COVID shot when you're pregnant or trying to conceive or breastfeeding. Um, but the one that is, ha, is really, um, uh, really interesting in some sense for the current um, uh, moment is the great CIO debacle. CIO is crying it out. And for some reason, parents in the Global North at the moment, and not just the Global North, because these forums, these are English language ones that I've picked out here, but there are people from wide numbers of countries participating. Crying it out is something where people are extraordinarily po polarized and they are absolutely sure that the scientific evidence is on, is on their side. Crying it out is some, is some form of what others call sleep training. And the people on one side believe that if babies sleep and that the parents and the babies are better rested, less ner have, have a calmer nervous system and are generally healthier and progress and develop better. The anti-crying it out people believe that there's historically, there's, you know, in relation to who we evolved as, we attended constantly, we were in bodily contact with our infants. The whole point of a cry is to attend to them. Maybe there's bed sharing, but certainly you would never leave a baby to cry. And there's no such thing as sleeping through the night. 
Um, you attend to the baby when they need you. That's the whole point. That's what mammals do. And that's better for your long-term psychological um, development and your trust in people. Um, so the, and every, each side of this, it's so polarized and each side of it's absolutely sure they're right. And they post up as if it were um, one of the polarized debates that we've, we've become so familiar with in recent US politics. Um, but as far as I can tell, it isn't particularly divided in that way. It isn't particularly divided in a political way. So it gives us a chance to um, step outside of our political investments to look at what it means for social media to exaggerate affective polarization. Okay, and then just to just to wrap up, let me say, you know, what it, no surprise, the risks are exactly what they always were for um, reproductive technologies and exactly what they are for all areas of AI in everyday life. Um, there's bias, um, the, there's black uh, AI itself, black boxes, things of the training, the training data um, reproduces historical bias, data selection, and visual bias, and you get disparate error rates by race and so on when you're using images. Um, Deselection is really common in all technologies to do with um, reproduction and has been for centuries and continues to be with uh, the entire um, point of using AI in reproduction, which is to find the healthiest, whatever. Um, and it, so the potential to be extremely ableist is um, rife. Misinformation is a huge area, false advertising for these apps for all kinds of gadgets and things, um, and then social pressure to participate um, in these, in um, one add-on, as they call it in the facility industry, one add-on or another. The technological imperative that um, you ought to socially and medically ought to um, experience pregnancy and childbirth technologically, that somehow you're depriving your children if you don't, and then health disparities, price and medical care bar barriers. Um, so AI definitely promises to bring down the cost of IVF per cycle or per baby um, for some condi conditions, but every time you add on and normalize more procedures, you exaggerate the difference between mediated and unmediated reproduction. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Valdez and Dr. Thompson for your absolutely terrific contributions. Um, and I already know I feel I know so much more about the intersection of artificial intelligence and reproduction. Um, I have a bunch of questions and I'm going to kind of take Chair's privilege in asking those, but I want to call on to our great audience to start putting thoughts, comments and questions into the Q&A section um, in the Zoom webinar. I will pick those up um, and bring them in and bring you into the conversation. And so I want to start with um, two things that you said. Natalie, you said, we don't need more biomarkers to understand who gets sick. Uh, and Karis, you spoke about the just now the technological imperative, which I will admit was something I was kind of listening in for in a way. Um, and so I would love to hear from both of you um, if and in what ways you know, these technological devices and these socio-technical practices um, are actually reconfiguring how we view ourselves in our own bodies or how, how um, you know, the body they're reproducing or not reproducing or, you know, differently reproducing body is experienced uh, and how maybe that is talked about. Um, and maybe, Natalie, we can start with you. Um, and then go over to Karis. You mute it. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, so your question about are you? So I'll address the question on um, the bio with the comment I made about biomarkers. Is that the one you would like? Yes. And I was I was just wondering if if we are generating knowledge. You know, we've always generated knowledge in and through technology, right? It just seems that there's a narrative that things are different now with AI because we're talking at a different scale, and we're also perhaps seeing. And this is a, a question I have: uh, a reconfiguration how we know our own bodies and our 
reproducing bodies through these data driven technologies that become available to us or that we are confronted with either because we participate in clinical research or we are forced to participate because we participate in the healthcare system in in whatever way or because we because we choose to because we download a tracker okay yeah yeah absolutely well to uh, i'll i'll try to circle my way back to this um, relationship that you're describing about how our how technology and innovations um, are remodeling reproduction in a particular kind of way and then our relationship to that but just the comment on on biomarkers what i mean um, by that is is to bring attention to um, some of the over reliance and over dependency on predictive precision medicine to solve problems at a structural level and uh, but without any understanding on the degree of excess dissemination and whether or not that would actually be needed in particular cases so i'm speaking specifically about um, the realm of obesity and diabetes in which uh, most traditional frameworks and etiology, well, etiologies around these metabolic syndromes have um, primarily defined the problem as one of individual choice and will. And so if you just change what you eat and, and how much you exercise, then you could prevent and maintain your health. So, and then if, if we could take your blood throughout pregnancy and track uh, and compare it to people who developed gestational diabetes and people who didn't develop, then we might be able to say something about that difference. Um, and we might be able to have an indication of who might develop gestational diabetes. And while, um, again, that might be an indicator using um, post-genomic technology, there is already information that tells us a very similar answer which is, for instance, um, houseless pregnancies have highest higher rates of GDM than non than stable house stably housed people and employed people. Um, we don't see housing as a biomarker and we don't see it as a sexy technology. Uh, and that is the, the core issue for me in the widespread speculation around um, AI and predictive precision medicine. It's that we actually are looking for uh, trying to use technology to find answers where we already have answers. And so um, the question is, is that the best use of our resources? And that's, that's the kind of light I'm trying to shed on what is the role of AI in relation to reproduction and the role that reproduction has played in helping us understand technologies in a post-genomic era. Um, and I think that the, the, the bigger question around um, how this technology can or cannot remodel our relationship to reproduction has so much to do with access and the stratification of reproduction. So if we're not able to assess that um, still in the United States, Black women have a higher infant and maternal mortality rate across economic status. Um, we don't need AI to tell us that there is a problem with systemic racism, institutional racism. Uh, but again, uh, addressing that doesn't require AI. And so then how do we want to think about these problems and their solutions? And oftentimes what Karis um, mentioned in her slide, and this is the baton pass to you, Karis, um, the, the technological imperative becomes so overwhelming in relation to how we're framing and defining the problems and the solutions. Thank you, Natalie. And ab absolutely, I mean, just just you know, agreeing with everything, everything you said there. Um, you know, the self responsibilization, the individualization and the putting it all into this agency side of the equation as well. Well, first of all, for those for whom it is useful, they don't feel full of agency. So if you are a woman who's trying to keep a professional job going and you've just had a baby or you're trying to conceive or you're trying to be pregnant, it is almost impossible. You have maybe 12 weeks if you're incredibly lucky of maternity leave. 
in the US. Um, it's it's absolutely brutal. And anything you can do to keep, you know, to have control, to have any kind of control, to have any kind of um, access to how to be a tailor man, to how to be somebody who is able to show up and, and uh, you know, able to conserve your fertility, track your fertility and make it fit with the rigors, especially in a place like the US where there is, and of course it's, it's up in the air, it's being debated right now, this question of any kind of um, family leave after any kind of maternity leave or after birth. Uh -huh. um, but also the people for whom um, it's, it, it doesn't matter, that may be your, your circumstance as well, as, as Natalie said, for many, many people, um, women of color, many people living in um, in places where, it, or living with conditions, or living in con living with um, resource poor conditions, um, your hormonal profile in other ways, as well as everything about what you have access to in terms of food, but medical care, medical monitoring, medical care, is um, it's so compromised very often that um, the it, it it's 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 over it's the overwhelming thing. And likely, and all your odds for from from um, uh, premature birth, just just almost from neglect, but certainly from under monitoring or being underserved medically, um, become by far the most important thing. Um, and you were mentioning everything ra ranging from food deserts um, in terms of uh, blood sugar. Um, through to when you're able to eat, what food you can access on the job, what food you can access, um, a walk if you can't, if it's a if it's a luxury to be able to use your car from your home, and so on. Um, uh, so so yeah, I, I think I think you know it it has uh, to go back to your question, Mona, about what change it's made made um, for people. I think that it has become um, something that. Uh, that you uh, almost that you it, it's not compatible and to some extent if we look at some of the older statistics so many for example women in academia in the quote-unquote olden days didn't have children um, those who have children were were often very wealthy and or had somebody who was a family member who was able to move in and do multi-generational care against a background of, a, of an ideology of the nuclear family and the meritocratic nuclear family with, with that's heterosexual and um, with one mum, one dad and the children, which obviously has built into it a massive care deficit when you need at least two salaries to even pay for the most basic of housing. Um, so in some sense, it's, it's um, I would say it's almost for, for many people, and if you have student loans, if you followed this path of the meritocracy, which of course has been critiqued by so many scholars that I, um, uh, but you know, if you follow this path into, you know, two or a single, a single person um, trying to uh, adopt or have children, um, the economic imperatives are such that the technological imperative becomes um, one thing you can do that's absolutely, almost, I would say, almost essential um, if you want to stay even in some relation to that narrative. And people are so judgmental. It's not as if the life course judgments have stopped. It's not as if people have started saying, this is who you should pair up with. You should pair up. You should child bear. This is when you should. This is how you should. This is under what conditions. That has not stopped. And indeed, it's still taken in many cases to be signs of in this tremendously circular and again, much critiqued um, kind of symbology of meritocracy, um, the thing that it's all about. So I think in some sense, it's I, I kind of want to say that it's both incredibly um, divisive and non-optional for those for whom it's, um, it's for whom you're trying to um, play, uh, hold on to that path of being, um, do, of, of, um, of fulfilling this meritocracy, which is that kind of line between, well, let's not even go there. <laughs> yeah, so that's my, that's my answer. Thank you so much.
um, Natalie and Karis. And I just want to invite you also to um, comment on each other's points or ask questions. And again, uh, to the audience, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Um, Natalie, you said that stable housing is not a sexy technology, um, which I thought was a wonderful, wonderful term. And, and Karis, you just kind of, in, as always, very compelling ways um, connected AI, or essentially kind of said, well, AI is a is the is a technology of meritocracy or of perpetuating the narrative in a certain way, which was extremely interesting. I have one other question that is almost pragmatic against the backdrop of these extremely rich conceptual points that you just made, which is um, almost about time, right? The the question that I have for you is, um, does the notion of AI assisted reproductive technologies or AI assisted research on reproduction stop at reproduction or does it actually go with the body and spill over into, you know, things later down the line, giving birth, child rearing, um, everything that's connected to this. Where is kind of the ontology, are there, has AI changed that ontological boundary or reinforced it? Or is AI in reproduction really focused on literally the reproducing body and that's it? Natalie, maybe you can start. I would say that um, maybe, so I, I look at technology through the lens of post-genomics. So if I think about the science and post-genomics that's bridging um, nature, nurture, the biological, the cultural in that sense, the uh, end developmental origins of health and disease, which is so epigenetics coupled with DOHAD research are part of this post-genomic landscape. Um, and uh, reproduction in particular can tell us a lot about um, these areas of, of, of new emerging technology around epigenetic sequencing and whatnot. So I would say with regards to um, technology in post-genomics and AI technology, which I would say is, you know, within the umbrella of precision predictive medicine, big data. Um, I think that everything is fair game from the micro molecular level to the, um, you know, physiological metabolic scale to the built environment scale, and then across time. So here we're thinking about a, you know, that how these technologies are not just um, impacting one body, but we think about it in a multiple uh, generational capacity and across the lifespan. So uh, the technology coupled with post-genomic um, uh, theories of biological development have expanded the uh, forms and uh, of surveillance across the lifespan. Anyone deemed reproductively capable are now um, a fair game for targeting uh, before, during, and after. And um, there, are, like Karis was saying, there's so much moral judgment around how we use the technology to shape these potential decisions. So it's the anticipation of making a right choice. And then it's the like gestational period of like, if you do the wrong choice, you will have, you will be blamed for generations. And then it's an infant child development space of, of like, there's, you know, never something you can do well. Um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, it's completely expanded the chronicity of surveillance across generations and across the lifespan and at different kinds of environmental scales. Yeah, thank you. Um, the One of the words that comes up sometimes is this idea of pre-viva rather than survivor, this idea that you preemptively have a condition that and that applies in the fertility regime as well. But I also wanted to give a nod to a couple of other people's work that um, so I was thinking of Martin Smirtina's work um, and other people who've been working in the, in the arena of LGBT reproduction, where the idea of even being able to have procreative intent, even being able to have 
so it wasn't just a, a just a looking back wasn't just a temporality of backwardsness but was a temporality of intergenerational continuity this, this uh, again it's a lovely concept of procreative intent but something that became possible with you know people will say the gaby boom but with the technologies that enable people to have biologically related or to be able to adopt um children within non-heterosexual um, marital relationships in different parts of the world and of course it's a, it's that is very much not an established um right uh, globally yet at all um, and then another another thing I was thinking about was the the idea, um, you know, for example, the concept that Franz Windance Twine has developed of the fertility continuum, and um, really emphasizing the idea that comes out of reproductive justice that it's not just um, that you 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 should be allowed to have or not have the children that you desire to have, but that you should be allowed to keep them. They shouldn't be disproportionately susceptible to being removed by the state, to use Dorothy Roberts's framing of that, but also that they should thrive and you should thrive, that you should be healthy and well-fed and housed the things that Natalie was talking about as unsexy, um, but that we know are really important biomarkers, the huge biomarkers. Um, but also this, this idea that, the, that we might be able to use AI, that we might be able to use um, better procedures, better predictions, and you know, if we bring the unit cost down, have more community fora, and that there might be that there are actually some opportunities to interrupt in important ways the um, fertility continuum that is inherited from um, phylogenetic ideas or um, um, racial, hierarchical, and class based ideas of the um, relative worth of different people's reproductions. Thank you so much both for this, for that richness. And we had a question, um, Natalie, which I think you answered with a link. Um, and so we are almost at time. So I want to invite both panelists to perhaps close us off with a statement, um, AI and reproduction or co-opting AI and reproduction. How should we think about that? <laughs> Um, I think that I, I don't have a great uh, pithy take home, except for that I kept struggling for a definition of AI. So um, that, uh, but in thinking about AI, I also struggled to have a, to land on a definition of reproduction because I was thinking, oh, I'm asking you what AI is defined. And then what if you asked me what reproduction is? <laughs> and then I would probably have said the same thing, which was like, we don't have an agreed upon definition. But um, I think for me, uh, the, 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 the phrase that I gravitate to in thinking that grounds my understanding of reproduction is Michelle Murphy's uh, phrase, um, which defines us as the capacity to live intergenerationally. And uh, if we think about reproduction as the capacity to live intergenerationally, and then we think about technology and its speculative predictive um, kind of uh, amassing of, of data and sources, then potentially the, the connection there is this, is exactly what um, you, had point, you had pointed out, um, Mona, which is, the attention to temporality and how we want to experience this kind of intergenerational living and, um, and what methods and tools we would draw from to shape those experiences. So that's all I have. <laughs> that's a perfect segue to my final comment, which is in other work, I'm trying to see what it would take for governments to think of migrants as fulfilling some of the fertility gap and as they um, fear the 21st century demographic crisis of low fertility. Um, and uh, one of the more hopeful concepts is intergenerationality, which used to be, which was originally introduced around Grohal and Brundtland's report in the, in the 80s, in 92 at Rio, it became um, combined with North-South equity over time and over place. Um, and that gave it this, um, this kind of uh, uh, dimension of not just fairness, but that different fates of more and less privilege were related to one another. Um, and so for me, it's the idea that we come to be able to think about reproduction, climate and migration 
together, what it's going to take for us to think those things together and to solve some of our most pressing social problems um, in ways where, where our capacity to think and devise policy and act and treat one another in certain ways bridges those, those sectors. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, huge gratitude for, for, for this conversation for both of you. Uh, thinking things together and uh, living uh, intergenerationally um, and with certain views for temporality and the future. I think that is a wonderful way to close off this co-opting AI event on reproduction. Um, thank you so much both. Thank you audience. Thank you team for making this possible yet again uh, a smoothless uh, uh, show and I look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. Please tune back into our next co-opting AI show, I should say, which will be on advertising uh, wow. in December. So stay tuned for that. I'm very excited for that conversation as well. And thank you so much, Dr. Nata Dio Valdez. Buy her book out next month, Weighing the Future. Yeah. <laughs> Very important work and ethnography and cares. Thank you so much as well, Dr. Thompson, for your time uh, and generous comments today. Thank, thank you, you both. Mona. Thank you, thank Mona. You, Mona. Sam, Zari, and, and the audience. It's a, a huge yes, pleasure to talk, talk and think with you all about making, making hopefully a more bearable future. Thank you. Take good Bye. care. Take care. Be safe. Bye.